Good evening. My name is Tammy Ashford Carroll, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to the 26th annual Listervelt Middleton Lecture Series, sponsored by the Comedic Institute for Health and Human Development. We will now have a brief history of the Listervelt Middleton Lecture Series presented by Dr. William Gunn, followed by the introduction of our speaker by Eldridge Gunn. Dr. Gunn, can you unmute? You need to unmute. The Listen Up Middleton Lecture Series was a brainchild of Alvin Cannon, a Benedict College student. To date, we have had 26 lectures. Who was Listerville? Listerville was a Benedict graduate. And shortly after he graduated from Benedict, Listervelt became. Became the host of ETV. Program for the people where he exposed the world to true African history. Some of the scholars that came that participated on his program that he interviewed. Dr. Sheikh Anta Dia, Dr. Ben, Dr. Henry Clark, Sterling Stuckey, Ivan Van Sertima, Marimba Ani. Listervelt went out and tried to find the best of the best. Listervelt was a true warrior. In Columbia, South Carolina, they tried to fire him at one time after Francis Cress Wilson presented her theory, her Cress theory of color. But I was surprised, like many, that the whole community came out in his support. They could not fire. Not only was Elizabeth a journalist, but a poet as well. Three of my favorite of his poems were on the origin of things. Warhorn, The Charge. Elizabeth was loved by many. When he was sick, scholars from all over the world came to Benedict College to honor him. And at my recommendation, Benedict College's alma mater awarded him posthumously the Doctor of Humane Letters. And so this lecture series will continue to honor the legacy of Elizabeth Milton to help enlighten, uplift, and ultimately to return African people to our rightful place. Good evening. My name is Eldridge Gunn, and I'd like to introduce to you tonight Sister Angie Porter. Sister Angie Porter serves as managing editor of the Compass Journal of the Association for the Study of Classical African Civilizations. She works as a research fellow and adjunct professor at Georgetown University Law Center, where she teaches a seminar on Africana legal studies. Previously, she worked in Minnesota as an attorney at a large Minneapolis law firm, a federal judicial law clerk, an investigator of discrimination and sexual misconduct at the University of Minnesota, and an adjunct professor at Mitchell Hamlin School of Law. She is former vice president and treasurer of the Minnesota Association of Black Lawyers. Sister Angie attended Howard University for both undergraduate studies and law school and served as editor-in-chief of the Howard Law Journal. You can follow her at Angie Marissa on Twitter. Thank you for taking time from your busy schedule 
And thank you for sharing with us your words and wisdom, Sister Angie Porter. Thank you so much, Brother Steve. And thank you to everyone joining in tonight. You know, this is the schedule. Um, so the, the busy schedule with work and all of that is uh, secondary to the work that we're doing. So I just want to start by saying, do I thank you to you all. Thank you to our ancestors who our work is an offering to. And I want to thank my elders, all of those involved in the Catalyst and Bongi for inviting me, um, the Comedic Institute, all of those on this webinar, Sister Janice, Sister Tammy, Brother Skeet, uh, Baba Bernie for inviting me, and also our presiding elder, Dr. Gunn, thank you so much for giving me permission to speak today to you all. So I have to say, I am just so humbled <laughs> by this opportunity to be in that long line of Listervelt Middleton lecturers. Um, these are giants and I am just humbled to be in their wake as I make this attempt to present something that might be helpful to us in our community today. And I also wanna shout out Columbia, South Carolina. I have never been, but it is my ancestral home. My people were originally the Portese and they came up from Columbia, uh, migrated north to Philadelphia in the early 1900s. So uh, I really need to get down there and actually see y'all and visit y'all and explore that ancestral homeland of mine. So I'm talking today about this concept of listening. The title of this presentation is Comedic Protocol, the concept of listening to determine truth, which really relates to Listervelt Middleton quite a bit. And so I thought it's only fitting that we start tonight by listening to his words directly, which he so graciously preserved for us to hear. So I'm just gonna share my screen now so that we can take a listen to one of those poems that Dr. Gunn mentioned, one of his favorites on the origin of things. Oh, and I think I have to share sound here. Okay, here we go. Look around you, black child. Your creation is everywhere. Though painted, distorted, given new names, they bear your prints just the same. So sharpen your eyes, tune your ear, so you know what you see, understand what you hear. You were the first to write, the first to read. Humanity sprang from your black seed. For 110,000 years, you were here alone, and then the Caucasian man was born. Behind the ice, inside the cold, a chill set in this new man's soul. Other minds have been credited with the things they learned from you. Newton, Pythagoras, Kepler, and Galileo too. Sharpen your eyes, tune your ear, so you'll know what you see, understand what you hear. You made the serpent the symbol of the healing arts, and African justice was goddess Mott, who weighed herself against the African soul, truth and justice blindfold. The George Washington Monument is yours too, a copy of the African Tekanu. The symbol of the black world's powers of creation, the black man's penis in divine procreation. The king of southern Egypt wore the white crown. Keep listening and you catch your mouth. When you learn that the central government in Egypt was known as the White House, 
Sharpen your eyes. Tune your ear so you'll know what you see. Understand what you hear. Your God, Osiris, was restored to life long before Buddha, long before Christ. Mm -hmm. And today, what you call the Madonna and child is but the first black family worshipped long the Nile. And when you feel the Spirit, the Holy Ghost, you should know it started at Abydos, where God Osiris's body was laid, the Holy Land, where Africans prayed. Minute by minute, hour by hour, as you lose your history, you lose your power. So sharpen your eyes, tune your ear, so you know what you see, understand what you hear. Okay, I hope everyone was able to hear that okay. All right, so I'm going to bring up this presentation, which we're going to sit in for a little while. All right, so comedic protocol, the concept of listening to determine truth. And as we just heard Listervelt Middleton say, and that's from his poem on the origin of things from uh, the collection later collected by Asa Hilliard in the text called True of Voice, the poetry of Listervelt Middleton. He says, so sharpen your eyes and tune your ear so you know what you see, understand what you hear. And if you were listening, you heard him talk about Kemet quite a bit, ancient Egypt, classical Africa, the Nile Valley civilization, talked about it quite a bit in that poem. So that's really where we're gonna focus tonight is on Kemet, on our distant ancestors from that nation, that civilization. So the first thing I want to note is that Kemet really emphasizes this idea of balance duality. You see symmetry everywhere in the iconography of Kemet. Here pictured is the Avenue of the Sphinxes, which um, some of us have had the, the privilege to actually walk along in Egypt. And you see just the symmetry here depicted with the Sphinxes on either side of this walkway and the balance that that communicates. So our early ancestors in the Nile Valley took this idea of duality very seriously. We see it in the iconography of, for example, the Pharaoh, the ruler. Here are a couple that I love. So we have one of the introductory glyphs of the Pharaoh's name. This is known as the Insubidi name or the Nisut Beat. You have these uh, glyphs and then the, the two T's here. So one interpretation of this, which I just find fascinating, is this idea that this represents the Pharaoh's position, but it represents both the permanence and the temporary nature of that position. So you have the suit plant. And that is the place or the office itself, the position of Pharaoh or ruler. And then you have the bee who is representative of the visitor to this plant. So the, the visitor is temporary. That's the individual Pharaoh at that time is the bee that comes to pollinate this plant. Balance, duality. You also have the Nebeti or the two ladies name. So one of these are, these are uh, two of the five different names that are given to the Pharaoh. And so this name uses the iconography of Nekebet and Wajet. These are two uh, divinities, I guess we'll say in Kemet. Nekebet represented by the vulture glyph which incidentally also represents the idea of mother, moot. And then we see Wajet, 
Both of these, by the way, also have this undertone of referencing Upper Kemet, which is uh, the older southern part of Kemet, and Lower Kemet, the newer, relatively newer, <laughs> northern part of that nation. But also, if you look at Nekebet and Wajet, you see this idea of, again, mother, motherly nurture. So the Pharaoh is wanting to be a nurturer of the nation. But at the same time, Wajet is a cobra and can strike. So you get that nurturing side and that fierce side. Two seemingly opposing ideas brought together in balance in one person, the Pharaoh. Another instance of balance that I'm sort of obsessed with and could talk about <laughs> for a long time, but I'll keep it short today, is that of Heru and Satek. So Heru and Satek are the, these two legendary figures in Kemet and uh, Kemetic origin stories. And they, in short, represent the ideas of youthfulness and innovation and being an elder and uh, upholding tradition. So here is a really great representation of the balance of these two figures, Heru being the younger um, from Lower Kemet, Satek being the elder from Upper Kemet, and they're incorporating both of these forces into this one person, the Pharaoh. So my point here is that balance and duality just permeates the Kemetic consciousness. One last instance and well-known example is this idea of ma'at. Ma'at, <laughs> represented by a literal scale. So you can't get more balancey than that, but also represented by this feather. And most translations say that ma'at is the idea of truth and justice and balance and order. Um, Dr. Mario Beatty, adds some nuance into that definition, saying that it actually is representative of our interconnectedness with one another. So it's, it goes beyond truth and justice and balance, but the communal interrelatedness. So if one aspect of community is off, it's gonna be felt by everyone else. So think of balance in that way. But here we have the popular depiction from the book of coming forth by day of the heart uh, weighing scene. And this is a deceased person. Here is their heart representing their soul, their deeds, their character being weighed against the feather of Ma'at. So we can think of this as sort of a, your heart should be as light as a feather. And if you remember the poem, by Listervelt Middleton, he said, the goddess Ma'at who weighed herself against the African soul. So this is what he's referencing. Note here that Anubis, Anpu, one of the divinities or manifestations of the divine is like calibrating this scale with this counterweight. <laughs> and that's how it ultimately is balanced, but you can see the weight that the heart is carrying being measured against that feather. So everything has its counterweight is the point. Here, that's what Anpu is literally touching, <laughs> but everything has its counterweight. So often we focus on this idea of speech when we're thinking about Kemet, good speech, medu nefer, uh, divine speech, medu nature. You may have heard these terms. They all use the word medu, which is here, which represents speech. But we don't really talk about the counterweight as much. And so that's really what this presentation is about, to help achieve that divine balance, that ma'at, that our ancestors were very much prioritizing in all of their deep ideas um, I'm going to be talking about the counterweight to speech, which is listening. Our role as listeners to determine truth, among other things, but listening in general. 
So we're gonna spend some time just thinking about that concept. Now, listening is represented by the word sejem. And the main glyph in sejem is this ear, this animal ear. It's like a horse ear or a cow's ear or something. But that is, you know, pretty self-explanatory. We're talking about listening with our ears. And we're going to think about four different ways of listening. Listening for good speech, listening to elders for wisdom, listening as community members and listening to ancestors. To do this exploration of listening, I'm mainly going to be referencing the text that's shown here. This is the actual papyrus of the instructions or the teachings or the Sebaiit of Ptahhotep. It's a little bit about that. This is a text that comes to us from 4,000 years ago, fifth dynasty in Kemet. And this is Ptahhotep's wisdom teaching. It's said that he was about 96 years old when he left these instructions to his successor or son. And we don't know, I mean, that could be son in the African sense, which is really expansive, doesn't require blood relation. But, you know, the Western Egyptologists translate that as son. So he's writing this text and passing it down to whoever is going to be in his position after him. And Ptahhotep's position is that he is the vizier of Kemet. He's the Pharaoh's like right hand. So we'll be looking at this wisdom text for Ptahhotep's recommendations on listening. That first thing, listening for good speech. This is one of my favorite quotes of all time. Good speech is as rare as green stone, yet it may be found among maids at the grindstone. This comes early in the text of the teaching of Ptahhotep. This is actually uh, Dr. Jacob Carruthers' rendering of that quote. And this, is, this comes after Ptahhotep says, don't be arrogant or proud in your knowledge. So this is like a humbling quote here. <laughs> He's saying good speech is rare, but don't just go looking for it among your speakers, your charismatic leaders, your people with certif uh, certifications and degrees and credentials. Listen to it in all the places from all the people, our people, everyday people without all of that prestige in mind. You cannot have good speech without good listening. You have to listen for it. Someone must be a hearer of good speech. Someone has to receive it, find it, seek it out. So as we're thinking about being listeners today, we really should recall this. Listervelt Middleton, for example, with For the People, I mean, he was doing this. So for those of us who are in positions to connect people who are speakers to people who are hearers, we ought to remember that the standard is not, it's not who or it's not how, but it's the quality of the message. It's the good speech itself. And that can be found in anyone. So I wanna to move to listening to elders for wisdom. And this is just a brilliant quote from our ancestor, Tahotep, who says, listening is useful to a son who listens. When listening enters into the one who listens, the one who listens becomes a listener. He listens well, who speaks well. Listening is useful to one who listens. Listening is better than anything bringing love and happiness into being. How good is a son who received when his father speaks? He becomes old through it. Now, Dr. Jacob Carruthers says that this quote is the comedic way of emphasizing intergenerational knowledge transfer. This is about teaching, learning, growing wise through listening. So children are listening to elders, and this is how they become elders. 
I'll note too, this is Patahotep here looking very dignified <laughs> and keep in mind, he's in the role of an elder as he's writing this. So he's advising young people that they may become wise by listening to their elders like him. When's the last time you just sat with an elder? Let's start with our family members. When's the last time each of us just sat and listened for that wisdom from our elders? So we have to take time to shift and think about our role as listeners. You know, listening is just as important as speaking and teaching. It's necessary for our growth to become elders, to develop into wise people, all the way to being Tahotep's age of 96 and beyond. Now, the third and fourth category, I'm really gonna spend some more time on. Um, the third being listening as community members. So here we all are in our virtual Mbongi. And as uh, Keikia Bunseki Fukiao has taught us and has written, an Mbongi is a shelter, a simple shelter where community members discuss and debate where their decisions are made. I mean, this is protocol. This is African governance here. And it's centered on this balance of speaking and listening to each other. So to be a successful Mbongi, members must be listeners. And I know y'all over at Catalyst Mbongi know this very well. And this is an idea that we see in Kemet 4,000 years ago. So I wanna talk about listeners. Sejem. This word, sejemiu, is the plural form of listeners or hearers. It's often translated by Egyptologists as judges or witnesses. I don't really like either of those terms, <laughs> being in the law especially. I don't like either of those value-laden terms because they bring a lot of ideas, sharply defined ideas from the West. So when we talk about judges, we're really thinking about people wearing black robes and people wearing powdered wigs appearing in court and making decisions and oftentimes sending our people to prison. So, you know, I prefer the literal translation, which is hearers, it's simply hearers. So let's take that translation of this word. And before I go on, I just wanna point this uh, photo out. This is the ear stella of Bay which was discovered, I guess they would say, in the temple of Het Heru in Waset, the capital at one point of Kemet. But you can see the ears here. So the ears are depicted very prominently showing that uh, listening is this major concept in Kemet. All right, so going back to this Sejemiyu idea, turning to Ptahotep and his wisdom. He says, if you are a person who judges, we're going to say who hears, listen carefully to the speech of one who pleads. Don't stop that person from telling you everything they have planned to tell you. A person in distress wants to pour out his or her heart even more than they want their case to be won. If you are one who stops a person who is pleading, that person will say, why does he reject my plea? Why does she re reject my plea? Of course, not all that one pleads for can be granted, but a good hearing soothes the heart. The meaning of getting a true and clear explanation is to, the means rather, for getting a true and clear explanation is to listen with kindness. Just love that. So as Mbongi members, as community members, listen, without interruption. It's sort of in vogue to interrupt people, to, to stop them, to clap back. That's very in style. <laughs> so if you are in that position to hear a, a, someone's plea or hear their case, don't do that. Listen with kindness, don't interrupt. This is ancestral wisdom passed down over thousands of years. 
So as we're listening as community members, I wanna point out a couple of stories from Kemet where this, this idea comes up. And I don't really have time to go deep into these stories. Perhaps we can do that during the Q&A, but I'm distilling these down to their essence. So we have first the nine petitions of the farmer whose speech was good. That title is Dr. Carruthers um, making a more direct translation from some of the more popular renderings of the title, like the eloquent peasant, for example. So the nine petitions of the farmer, I mean, it's in the title. This person makes nine petitions. They make nine speeches because they've been wronged in the community. And they're appearing before a sejami, a hearer. We often focus on the actual speeches, <laughs> but today, again, we're bringing balance to our focus. I wanna talk about the hearing that happened. So not only do you have a, a hearer, a community member whose job it is to listen to these complaints and these petitions, these pleas, they listen to all nine without interruption. Impressive. <laughs> You have the Pharaoh. So as the, as the uh, farmer is speaking, of course, in Kemet, they are obsessed with writing. So they're transcribing his speeches and they ship those transcripts off to the Pharaoh. And the Pharaoh reads all nine petitions. And in the end, um, justice is granted. You know, they, they help the farmer and his wish is granted. But the point is there was some listening and there was some reading. And this is sort of remarkable today. I can't imagine sitting and listening to someone speak nine times, nine different speeches on the same issue. But this is a model. It's really a model, no interruption. We see the same thing show up in another comedic story, the story of Heru and Satek. Again, I won't summarize it in great detail, but. The main point is there's a succession conflict. There's a, a discussion, a debate about an Mbongi discussion about who is going to take the throne after Asir makes transition to become an ancestor. So you have Heru and Satek vying for the throne. And these, these people debate this for 80 years, according to the story, 80 years. At no point does anyone say, we're just gonna make an executive decision. At no point does anyone interrupt the speeches of either Heru and Satek. They just, they let it ride for 80 years and no decision is made until Satek in the very end concedes and says, you know what? Let's just give the throne to Heru. He's proven himself worthy. I'm out of this, I concede. So these things are really important because these show up in our tradition across Africana. There are many examples, but I just plucked one easy to find example. And that was in uh, Nelson Mandela's autobiography, Long Walk to Freedom. And it is this passage where he describes visiting Thembuland, an area in South Africa, and he's participating essentially in what we might call Mbongi, in these community decision-making meetings. So he describes the regent, the ruler, the head, the, the leader of those meetings, and says the regent would open the meeting by thanking everyone, explaining why they were there, and then from that point on would say nothing until the meeting was over. Everyone was heard. There were criticisms hurled at the leader. He would never defend himself. He just simply listened. And the meeting would continue until consensus. If there was no consensus, they just met again. Now this sounds really familiar. This sounds so similar to Heru and Satek. This sounds very similar to the nine petitions of the farmer whose speech was good. This silence, this listening is a common thread in the protocol of community in our African traditions from classical Africa forward. 
contrast that with some other hearers, <laughs> with some judges we see. So here is Bruce Schroeder, who is a judge in the American court system in Wisconsin. He presided over the Kyle Rittenhouse trial, that, uh, that travesty of a trial. And here he's yelling, interrupting, and yelling at the prosecutor, don't get brazen with me. One thing about judges in this Western legal system is that many of them talk too much and listen too little. They are definitely off balance. Schroeder, at least, is an example of someone off balance between speech and listening. And that, I think, is because in this setting, these participants are not guided by a tradition of speaking and listening. They are not part of that tradition that we're just talking about from classical Africa through Africana to today. They're guided by some other tradition. So just something to take note of. But we're just gonna, we're gonna get that, get that man's picture away. We're gonna leave that. <laughs> so let's continue on about listening as community members. So as members of the Mbongi, by simply listening to people, by listening to the Meduti, the speaker, that's this word here. Your silence is telling them what you're saying is important. We hear you. It's important and it's worthwhile. So it's a service to listen to others. You really do them a service. You all are doing me a service right now and I thank you. Also think about this. We have this word here, sejamash, which Egyptologists translate as servant. But if we look at the glyphs that our ancestors chose to represent this idea, the emphasis is really on hearing, that's the first part, sejum, and then doing with the arm here. And we have the person speaking. So this idea, this person in the community is someone who listens to and then uh, does what is asked of them. So the emphasis is not on this idea of serving and waiting on someone hand and foot, which I think is sort of like a Western thing, Western as in European <laughs> derived. This is really about listening. This person is saying, I, I want somebody who uh, listens to what I say and then you know takes action. So it reflects this idea of how important listening is in the comedic cultural logic, and also this idea that listening is a service in and of itself. So listening goes hand in hand with this idea of ma'at as community, as Dr. Beatty defines it. Again, beyond truth and justice, more about that sense of we, the we-ness the interconnectedness, the interrelatedness. So the way that we are connected is by how we relate to one another. When there is speech, there is listening. All right, the final category is listening to ancestors as maquette, which I'll explain right now. So Tahotep, so rich and wonderful guiding teachings and quotes, he said, this is a matter of teaching a person to speak to after. That's the word maquette, which is right here. He or she who hears it becomes a master hearer. It is good to speak to after. After will listen. Now this quote is emphasized by some of our great scholars and thinkers, Dr. Carruthers brought out this quote, drew out this quote, Dr. Greg Carr has written about and talked about this idea of maquette, this idea of posterity, the future, people who are not yet born, who are going to be listening to your speech one day or reading your speech and writings one day. So this is important for us as speakers because we have to make sure we are releasing good speech into the flow of time to after for those in the future. 
I want to make a note that from the standpoint of our ancestors, we are also Meket. We are after. We come after them. So we must also listen to the speech of our ancestors. So that part of the quote is really, you know, we are the ones who hear that speech. We must become those master hearers. Now, how do we do that? How do we listen to our ancestors as Maquette? Well, we can listen through, of course, recorded media, audio, video. We can listen to their speeches that way. We can also listen through reading. Carruthers, his rendering of this quote is right here. This comes from the instruction for Mary Carre, which is another wisdom text meant for a future Pharaoh, a future ruler, where he says, imitate your fathers and your ancestors. Their speeches endure in writings. Open and read them and copy the knowledge. So by reading, we're hearing those enduring words. Reading is a way of listening. I just wanna hone in just cause I can't help myself. This is such a beautiful quote. I wanna hone in on a couple of words in this quote. So the part that says open and read them uses this word, sheddy, read. As we look at this word, it has this glyph, this determinative, this glyph at the end that indicates the meaning of the word. And the glyph is the man pointing to his mouth. So I've read that this word can mean to recite, so like reading aloud, but also it could have that sense of taking the information in, literally eating it or ingesting the knowledge. And when we look at the related words, that's sort of suggested here. So changing the determinative, we also have this word, sheddy, but here it means take away, rescue, salvage, which has that sense of drawing out, drawing something out. And another related word is sheddy again, but with the breast determinative, and it means suckle, like drinking from one's mother's breast, which also means educate. So, I mean, this is such a, an amazing language with such symbolism. So I think when we look at all of these words together, reading is like drawing out the knowledge from writings. Reading suggests that the knowledge that is encapsulated in a writing is like our actual sustenance that we take in. So this is deep. This means of listening is deep. The second part of that quote, where Ptahhotep, or I'm sorry, Mary Kare, the instruction from Mary Kare directs us to copy the knowledge. That word copy is seni, which means imitate or be like or resemble. But if you look at the glyphs for this actual quote, it's this related word, sinny, with the uh, legs, the walking legs determinative, which means pass or pass by or surpass. So I think that this quote might have the sense of patterning oneself, patterning after the knowledge of our ancestors, but it also might mean to surpass that knowledge in the sense of taking up the challenge and extending our minds further than our ancestors by continuing their work or advancing their work. So when we listen by reading, we shouldn't just be ingesting the sheddy glyph, but we should be learning and applying and reflecting in ways that move like these walking legs in ways that advance the knowledge that carry on and continue the work in our time and in our situation. Again, just such depth in that language. So um, as we continue thinking about listening, and we've talked about listening to elders, we've talked about listening as community members, listening for good speech, we should also be listening to determine truth. And this is the final phase. So that means we have to be free from the noise. 
or isfet. Simple translation, chaos. And in order to be free from the noise, we have to be aware of what the noises are. I've always been fascinated by noise canceling headphones. I have, I actually have a pair, they are expensive, but <laughs> noise cancelers have always fascinated me. My dad is a, a computer programmer and just a general like sound technology person. And he taught me that noise cancelers actually have microphones in the headphones and they're listening for noise. And through the power of math, they project out sound waves that are the inverse of the noise. And the noise meets those sound waves and they cancel each other. It's, it just becomes silence. So again, fascinating technology. But what I take from that is you have to be aware of the noise in order to cancel it. There has to be this awareness. So we're, we're gonna be aware. We're gonna talk about some of the noise. One form of noise is interpreters. As Jacob Carruthers told us, African champions must break the chain that links African ideas to European ideas and listen to the voice of the ancestors without European interpreters. So we need to be aware that other people's ideas can be introduced into the characterization of our history and can be imported from other worldviews that don't match. So we have to be inquisitive about those characterizations as we're listening. That may mean going to the source and not relying on the characterizations. There's one example I always like to pick on being uh, in law, <laughs> it's this book by Russ Versteeg called Law in Ancient Egypt. Nice book, exciting for lawyerly types who are interested in Kemet. But you know, when you take a closer look, you see all of these Western, all these European constructs being brought in, being imported. So he's talking about the things like wills and divorce and crimes and incarceration, all of these things um, that come from the West. So this is this Egyptologist type, lawyer type person looking at this civilization of these Africans in Kemet and saying, oh look, they had what we have. That looks like crime. That looks like prison. This looks like divorce. This looks like a contract. And what they're doing is interpreting, they are projecting their worldview onto this other civilization, this European worldview onto this African people. On what basis? These are people with different histories, different ways of knowing, as Dr. Carr might say, different ways of knowing the universe around them. So this is a European interpreter introducing some noise. Dr. Carruthers reminds us, go to the source and listen to the voices of the ancestors directly. So in order to do that, we have the weighty task of, of studying language, studying comedic language, African languages, and also keeping the instructions, the say by eat of our ancestors, like Dr. Carruthers, like John Henry Clark, and many others at the forefront of our minds as they are giving us the interpretive key to get past that noise and to uh, take in our sustenance from the source. Another form of noise is distraction. I had to say this, <laughs> I'm a millennial. That means I'm intimately acquainted with some of the more recent distractions of our time, one of those being social media. This is a major source of noise. Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, doom scrolling on Instagram. I mean, that's noise and it's, it's a time warp. Um, it has its benefits, it has its advantages, but it can quickly become a distraction that impedes us from listening. We have other things like on-demand entertainment, it's great. Netflix, 
We got Hulu, Amazon Prime Video, YouTube, H- HBO. <laughs> I mean, it's all great, but this is also, by nature of being on demand, information overload. You can spend a whole day watching Netflix. And hey, maybe you needed that. Maybe you needed to decompress for that day, but then it can become multiple days. It can become part of your routine. And I just want to say our people are under constant attack and assault. We just can no longer afford, we could never actually afford for our brilliant minds to be droning on and on on TV for days on end. We just can't afford that. Not in this situation. So we need to be listening to the voices of our ancestors, to the teachings of our elders, being in community, listening for good speech. I mean, these things, these social media things and these on-demand entertainment things are good for recharging, but they cannot be our primary sustenance is the point. News is another thing. Okay, news is good. News is very good. We need to know what's happening around the world. I'm not trying to be little news, but we have to be aware, like the noise canceling headphones, of the shift in how available news is. This is no longer a situation where you just get the newspaper or you hear the news at six o'clock. No, there is a constant barrage of news. You get alerts, push notifications on your phone. (laughs) I mean, there's always new, new, new information. So we actually now have to affirmatively and intentionally create quiet from that. We need that quiet so we can listen and have the deep thought that needs to occur to help our community. So being intentional about the times you consume that knowledge, that news is imperative. And finally, I'll say one thing, one way to do this is to release your phone. I used to um, advise my juniors in law school, hey, look, law school seems hard, but in this day and age, you can succeed in law school by doing one simple, very simple, but very difficult thing. And that's putting your phone down putting it in the other room. Simple, but very difficult. So all of that noise floods our ear with voices and it really can become a time suck. So we need to clear the ear, we need to tune the ear and make time to listen. Only by freeing ourselves from these noises and being aware of the interpreters on top of that, will we be able to really listen to the words of our ancestors? and to the speech of our elders and to the speech of those in our Mbongi. So coming to a close here, I wanna go back to the words of Lister Belt Middleton who said, minute by minute, hour by hour, as you lose your history, you lose your power. Let's reclaim those minutes that have added up because of distraction. We have to reclaim that time. And As I noted, we are living in a changed world, so we cannot afford to be passive. We have to be intentional about listening. We have to make those appointments with elders and sit and listen without our phones distracting us, without doom scrolling, as they say. We have to be intentional about our reading time, setting that time aside. We have to maybe create a schedule of some sort, but We can't passively float along in this world anymore because we'll be whipped around by the information that others want us to hear. So if I could just leave us with anything today, it's to be intentional about this listening thing and ask ourselves, do we want to be master hearers that Patahotep talked about? The good thing is we have exemplars. We have many great exemplars of master hearers, Lister Velt Middleton being one, and many others. I mean, it could be your grandparents, family members, folk who read a lot. I'm thinking about people like Dr. Greg Carr, Dr. Lethia Watkins, Dr. Mario Beatty. I'm thinking about people like Baba Larry Crow with the History Makers and all of the great work he does. These people 
these exemplars, these master hearers, they have listened to those elders. They've listened to their ancestors. They've been in community. They have elevated good speech. So we should learn not only from their speeches, but also from their example of listening. So sharpen your eyes, tune your ears, so you'll know what you see, understand what you hear. And with that, Dua, thank you for being my Sejimu, my hearers, and I look forward to listening to you all during the Q&A. Thank you. Thank y'all so much. I see the chat. Sister Kathy, thank you. Good to see you. I don't know who's, I'll just sit here and wait until we- uh... The moderator should okay. be on shortly. Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, that was a very inspirational talk. And uh, we do have some questions and uh, I believe um, Tammy is our moderator for this evening. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you for this presentation, Angie. You have shared some great literary excerpts. Can you say more about what daily rituals of listening might have looked like in Kemet? in regards to relationships and or individuals? Oh, you know, thank you for that question, whoever asked. Um, one example that sticks out to me because along with some folks I see in the chat, Sister Kathy Adams, I'm an editor. You know, a lot of us have worked on the Compass Journal of ASCAC. And so looking back at Kemet, one thing that fascinated me is this idea of scribes who were, uh, I forget what they call them, scribes of, I'll have to come back to that, but they, they're essentially the editing scribes <laughs> in Kemet. And all they do is try to draw these really intricate glyphs, but they're learning from a, a master, they're apprentice scribes. And so they're tracing these glyphs on a grid and, oh, Scribes of Outlines. There's an exhibit called Scribes of Outlines that showcases some of these um, practice glyphs, essentially. And the master teacher comes in and corrects how they write these glyphs. So you have to, you have to remember, these glyphs are standardized. So each scribe has to write, they have to have great penmanship, I guess we might call it today. To me, that just represents that listening, you know, taking the time to apprentice, which is something that I, I fear is being less emphasized these days. The years, the amount of time it takes to apprentice someone and just observe and learn. Um, I mean, I, I had to do that to become an editor over many years, actually, I realized that I had to sit and look at people make edits and change speeches. My mom was sort of like a speech writer for a time. Um, I had a graduate advisor in the sorority I belong to, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And she and I sat for like 12 hours editing uh, bylaws <laughs> for the chapter. So all of those experiences are listening experiences that then help make you a good scribe. Um, so that's just one example that sticks out to me from Kemet and setting that time aside it is really taking your, your work seriously, but not doing it in a vacuum, doing it in community under the guidance of elders who are the experts. So thank you for that question. Okay, and that was Kathy Adams. Oh, um, Kathy, and, and, I, 
<clears throat> and she has another question here. Okay. Can you say more about what this work means for your new role in DC? Oh, wow. Yes. Wow. That is a good, <laughs> that's a good question. I haven't really sat with. Um, so my new role in DC, for those who may not know, is that I'm, I'm, I'm sort of a student law professor right now, but I will be a full-time professor in August at American University, Washington College of Law. And as I'm talking, I'm realizing I just said the answer. So this concept of listening is related again to apprenticing and um, being in conversation with elders. And I need to do better at that, honestly, um, and make the time for that. Because sometimes I do feel that I'm just flying by the seat of my pants, passively, <laughs> you know, finding myself in these situations where I can learn and not being as intentional. So I really need to be talking to people like Sister Kathy, who is a master teacher. Um, and, you know, it's sort of the out of sight, out of mind thing. So I need to, I need to follow up with you, Sister Kathy. But fortunately, I've been able to sit and listen to the folks who are here, who are teaching. Um, and just, I mean, I did a little of that today and these past few weeks talking with Dr. Greg Carr, talking with Dr. Valethea Watkins. And she and I talk a lot about teaching and the challenges and the opportunities. So knowing that I'm new to this, this is a great season of listening to prepare for next semester, but we have to continue to do it, even if we're in the role. Um, so anyway, hopefully that's a, a decent answer to the question. But yes, I, uh, I'm still listening and learning <laughs> intergenerationally. Okay. Um, please elaborate more on how noise has been employed as a weapon to prevent any meaningful dialogue in our current political climate. Mm. Wow, yes, okay, <laughs> wow. I mean, we all know that this is happening. Politicized noise, weaponized noise, and it's a lot easier these days. Um, I'm gonna take Instagram as the main example of this. So there are a lot of, um, there are a lot of, accounts on Instagram, on social media, designed to just indoctrinate people in these narratives, um, really damaging narratives for our people. And they're packaged in such a way where they seem harmless. They're memes, you know, memified, <laughs> very few characters, very low word count, but they're catchy and people share them and they, they pass around these memes. So I have a lot of friends on social media who just send me memes of stuff and they're jokes, but they're coming from an orientation that is not guided by our tradition. Um, I wish I could think of specific examples, but that to me is like the most dangerous, insidious part of social media is how folks think they're finding community in these spaces, but it's, um, it's not real community. And it's, it doesn't have the intergenerational component. It doesn't have the wisdom and teaching of sitting with elders and listening to ancestors. It's really just folks introducing their narratives in order to recruit minds into their ideology. So vague example, but it's, something that's top of mind. And I, I never can think of specific memes to use in that example. I need to, I need to work on that. Um, and then of course we have misinformation. I mean, I have my close relatives, intelligent, wonderful people with all kinds of depth of experience and knowledge who have fallen prey to some of these um, misinformation, disinformation campaigns, particularly around COVID, as we know, that's one salient example 
um, where it's literally hurting them. And they believe it because we're in the internet age, which is prevented, presented as an information age, but folks aren't doing what Dr. Carruthers instructed, for example. They're not going to the source. They're relying on memes and gifs and little quips, and they lack the nuance that would come up in conversation, that would come up in Mbongi. Um, so to me, social media is the big formidable impediment to this deep listening, to becoming master hearers, unfortunately. And I hope we can raise up our children to really be aware of that noise. Okay, thank you. Next question. How do you think that this can best be given to young people, especially reading? Okay. I think it goes back to the phone thing, <laughs> the devices, release your device. It's going to take parenting and not just from biological parents, but I mean like community, the community of parents, community of seniors, elders, to set that example for children by creating that quiet space and quiet time where it's device free. Um, I have niece and nephew and I, I see how the devices play into their way of being throughout the day. And I think they're early in this generation. So we have some lessons we can take from their generation. But one lesson I immediately see is that the devices need to be limited. Um, if there's ever time for conversation in the household, like during meals or something like that, we can be very intentional about creating spaces where conversation comes up and where listening and speaking can exist in balance. Another thing, and this is something I've been doing recently just for myself, um, that is to create time and space to listen by reading outside of the obligatory reading that we do for work, say for example, preparing for class or what have you. I wanna be intentional about reading and taking in that sustenance of knowledge beyond what I'm required to do. And so it started really small. I just said, I'm gonna read for 30 minutes today. This was back in like November. I just tried to set that goal of 30 minutes reading. So if you can do this with juniors, with children, um, and be the exemplar and do it too, together with them, just be in the room reading together, um, silently listening to the voices of our ancestors, enduring in writings. I think that's really powerful. So you start with 30 minutes and you may go to 40 minutes the next week, 50 minutes. You check it off on your calendar. The little visual check is really helpful. And so then you can decide how many hours do I want to do this each day? And it starts to become a habit that's reinforced by collectively doing it, but also by um, regularly, routinely, and intentionally making that space to read. So that's one thing that's worked for me. But I think the key point is being intentional about creating that quiet space that is distraction-free um, and creating those conversations to help people process what they're reading so they know and they can critique the interpretation that might be in there as well. Okay, thank you. If one is, this is from Jen Gary, if one is speaking the truth and listening party continues to not comprehend, what's their objective? Mm. Hmm. So what's the speaker's objective? Well, Unfortunately, we're in this environment, I think it's aided by the role of social media, where people are clinging to their opinion. You know, we've, we've run wayward from this tradition of listening to each other. Um, and so they, there's a lot of devotion to positions that are unmovable. And so 
immovable. And so be objective in a situation like that. I really don't, I really don't know. I mean, part of speaking and not being heard might be to default to listening and really listening carefully to that other person to understand exactly what they're grappling with and why they are not receptive to the, the dialogue, to the balance of the conversation. So I think sometimes we have to, I mean, you can't force somebody to listen to you. <laughs> so I think sometimes we have to fall back and try to understand what's really going on. What's the deeper thing that's happening here? Um, law is very listening centered, even though a lot of lawyers don't realize it. When you're talking to your client, you really should be listening to them to understand what are the main things going on in their head? What's on their heart? Because it might not be about winning. Recently, there was um, that situation in Georgia where Ahmaud Arbery's family was upset because the prosecutor said, we're going to win at all costs and we're going to get a plea deal with these murderers and we're going to give them a cushy little deal. That prosecutor wasn't listening to the family and what the family actually wanted, which was not to win in federal court, but was to make sure these folk who killed their son served their time where they should be in the state prison system in Georgia. So I think about that example a lot as a lesson of not stopping to listen. You know, when you, when you have a conflict, when you aren't matching, when your priorities don't match the other person, really the answer is to listen <laughs> and understand what their priorities are. So um, anyway, that's a long-winded, circuitous way of saying the answer, if you can't convince somebody to listen to you, might be to listen to them and reassess. Okay. And um, okay, here we go. And well, someone did say uh, in the chat to win at all cost was the oh, yeah. objective. But um, I have another one here. Building upon your master hearing, thinking, sharing tonight, it seems that we're mostly too afraid of the intimacy slash vulnerability slash risk of being judged that speaking, listening investments invite. We don't risk true conversational exchange because we only know Eurocentric judging, devoid of commitment to hearing, desperate mm -hmm. to protect or recruit folks to our position or posture. You helped us see that our deep culture embeds hearing into all judging. Any thoughts? Wow, thank you. Thank you so much for that. <laughs> um, I couldn't have said it better. I mean, that's it. This is a different cultural logic that we find ourselves in. We're in a different world sense that doesn't prioritize these things. And with the introduction of those technologies, those distractions of say social media, it's just become more entrenched in that foreign world sense that doesn't fit our ancestral values. So I would say taking the lessons, not only from Tahotep, but from those other stories, the nine petitions of the farmer whose speech was good, the Heru and Satek story. I mean, these are such classic examples of listening despite the fear of being judged or despite uh, wanting to protect our position and posture. In the Heru and Satek story, I mean, you, you get a great, dynamic, I mean, it's really good to read. I recommend it. You get this great dynamic of these elders. It's like a council of elders listening to these two argue who should become the Pharaoh. And you got people changing their minds. So they're not holding on to position just for position's sake. They're like, oh yeah, he's right. And then they listen, oh right, but he's right. So you get that dynamic, um, which is, Exemplary. I mean, we ought to model that idea of shifting positions based on 
getting more information. Um, and you get the community telling each other, oh, you're right, good point. It emphasizes this notion of dialing back the speaking and the imposition on others and really dialing up, just receiving information, just receiving the perspective of others in the community silently and reflecting on that. So we really have to tap into these stories and it doesn't just come from classical Africa. Like I mentioned, it, it comes from many points, many times and spaces across Africana, across the, the, the continent, the diaspora. It's just time for us to notice it. In addition to noticing speech, we should notice the listening examples. <laughs> Okay, thank you. Um, let's see, we have another question. You have referenced Africa in your speech, but Africa has been diluted by the History Channel by saying Africa was built by people not from here, but Europe was built by great white men, which was false. It all came from Africa. I have to search for the truth of how I am, we must understand what politics have done to us. What is a better strategy to deal with racism and the hate that we deal with every day? Mm. Wow. I don't have to reinvent this, fortunately. We can extend our hearts and our minds beyond the work of our ancestors. So we can build from what has been taught to us. So I would say, revisit the work of folks like Dr. Jacob Carruthers, like John Henry Clark, who are like Sheikh Anta Diop, who talk about the very thing you raised and sit with their writings and sit with their speeches. I, I mean, I'm just raising those three, but there are so many others um, because that, that's what they're talking about, how to reframe how to make sure that we're getting history from the source and we're cutting out those interpreters and cutting back those lies. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel here. We can rely on that work that is the result of lifetimes of listening. Um, these are the hearers. These are our ancestors who did that work. So, you know, I'm learning it too. I'm still learning it. We're all learning this in community with one another collectively. So I would say start from those types of speeches, those writings that help us access our true history. You, you said it perfectly. We have to get to the truth. We have to get beyond those lies. Fortunately, we have the tools to do it. They've been passed down to us. Okay. Thank you, Sister Angie. Thank um, you. I, <laughs> I don't see any other questions in the Q&A nor in the chat. So if we have no further questions, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Bernie Gallman. Angie, that was masterful. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, you know, uh, you you have a gift for condensing profoundly complicated information into uh, easily digestible uh, listening. So uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you. It's and nice uh, I want to also thank our uh, primary sponsor on point with uh, Cynthia Hardy. Uh, they have helped to uh, sponsor a lot of our activities for this year. Um, and I'd also like to thank everyone who visited uh, with us and benefited by this wonderful message. Um, we are going to continue to put forth programs and you'll be hearing from us uh, over the course of the year. Um, 
since we are primarily working in um, in in uh, virtual form, it makes it a little easier to uh, to put together programs. But we still have expenses, and because our programs are free, we always appeal to your generosity to please consider. Uh, tax exempt donation to the Comedic Institute. Uh, you can do it on the Eventbrite site and uh, Sister Eureka will put it in the chat, the ways that you can uh, contribute or donate. And uh, there's no such thing as a donation that's too small. Uh, we appreciate everything and uh, thank you in advance for that. Um, I'm going to yield to my elder, Dr. Gunn, to close us out. Dr. Gunn? Okay, thank you, Bernie. <clears throat> I'd like to thank Angie as well. As Bernie mentioned, that was an awesome presentation. Even as an elder, in terms of intentional listening, uh, I need to practice a little bit more. Um, I'd like to thank all of you who listened to the program tonight. And I'm sure Listervelt is happy that we are continuing to enlighten, uplift, and ultimately return African people to their rightful place. I like to say good night to everybody. And Ashay.